Welcome to ICMD webinars. I'm uh, Dr. Santosh Matthew, Training Coordinator of ICMDA, International Christian Medical and Dental Association. Uh, stepping in for Dr. Mm -hmm. Peter, who's away on leave. ICMD brings together over 60,000 or more Christian dentists and doctors in over 90 plus countries worldwide. Today's webinar, we are privileged to have a team of three from the CMC Velo, Christian Medical College Velo, India, speaking on the subject of promoting family medicine worldwide. The team is Dr. Frederick Kellerman, Dr. Jackin Velovan, and Dr. Rebecca Sekria. Fricky, or as he's well known, uh, Frederick Kellerman serves the Lord Jesus as a family physician, educator through CMC Velo in India since 2013. He's passionate about the Lord and about whole person education for the purpose of whole person healthcare. He has been involved in Healthcare Christian Fellowship since 1979. Before becoming a family physician, he did hospital-based medicine, community medicine, and training of clinical nurse practitioners for 10 years in rural Venda. And McCott's Hospital in Durban, he was part of the team of carers for 8,000 patients with AIDS. He is happily married to Esther, who loves and serves Jesus as a homemaker and a teacher. The second presenter would be Jackin, who is a family physician with special interest in primary healthcare in rural areas and innovations in medical education. She has worked for over 10 years in many rural mission hospitals in India. She is currently the faculty in the distance education department of Christian Medical College, Valor, and has been involved in developing and delivering need-based distance education courses. For the last 15 years, she has been involved in teaching general practitioners and government doctors across India and in other developing nations through blended learning programs in family medicine, as well as nurses and community lay leaders in basic primary healthcare delivery. She and her husband, Timothy, are blessed with two adult children. And the third presenter who's returning to us, uh, again, she had done a presentation earlier, Dr. Rebecca Sakria heads the distance education department at the same Valo. A geriatrician by training, Dr. Rebecca has always had a passion for teaching and had the God-given opportunity to be involved in medical education right from the beginning of her career. She completed a master's in higher education and has been involved with CMC's distance education team since early 2015. One of her focus areas is enabling learners to understand education as a whole and being able to equip others to teach and learn well. She is grateful to God that she has an excellent team to work with, who is here with her today, uh, and is able to run many courses and training programs on a blended learning platform in India and globally. The practice of Christ-centered family medicine is the name of the hour to deliver holistic healthcare across the globe. This webinar offers a glimpse into the DNA of family medicine practice, the need for more training and facilitation skills, and opportunities to be involved in medical education through a blended learning platform. The way this uh, webinar will work is the team will speak for about 30 minutes. Fricky will start and then Jackin will continue to be concluded by uh, Rebecca. So welcome once again, Fricky, Jackin and Rebecca uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, over to you, Fricky, to start off uh, your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Santosh, and uh, thank you to everyone that we can join you in this way. To us, it's a great privilege to be together, and uh, we pray it will be a blessing as we learn together. As you know, our topic for today is promoting family medicine worldwide, and maybe we could also say promoting family physician training worldwide. Uh, we would like to ask why promote this? And secondly, how to do this, some thoughts, and finally, uh, a few specific ideas on the international potated diploma in family medicine. So starting with the why, why promote uh, family physician training worldwide? I'd like to start with a summary. I'd like to present to you we feel why it is to be promoted it because the principles of true family medicine show something of the heart of God. Secondly, 
unique ministry to the whole person, the whole family, and the whole community. Thirdly, there's a global void, there's a global call, and it's also an answer to the problem posed by the ecology of medical care. And finally, the Lord is leading in this direction. That is what we want to uh, uh, share with you. Let me start by saying, why promote family medicine training? It is a unique ministry to the whole person, the whole family, and the whole community. Sometimes when we give a definition of a family physician, we like to keep it simple. And as you see here, we say a family physician seeks to promote whole person health, whole family health, and whole community health, including that of himself and his family. So the focus is really whole person, whole family, whole community. Now, I think we all know this painting called The Doctor, though I think maybe another name could have been given to it. When we look at this painting, we see so much of the principles of family medicine. You can just uh, think for yourself. I'm just highlighting a few here. We see the focus on the little person the importance of care and competence. We see the whole family is involved. The mother's hands are clasped together in prayer. Uh, we see it's in a home situation, the family is involved, and it's done in love. Now, these are just a few words that capture some of the true principles of family medicine, as you know, but it's just nice to share it with one another. Uh, considering that, we can say it shows the heart of God. If there's any principle in family medicine that does not show the heart of God, we believe it's not a true principle of uh, family medicine. So that was the first thought. The second is, as mentioned, we want to promote family medicine training worldwide because the principles of true family medicine show the heart of God. Here is another painting called The Consultation. And again, we see something of what happens in that interaction with the patient, with the family, and it shows something of the character of God. Thirdly, there is a global void as far as this is concerned. I'd like to present to you just uh, a brief overview uh, from different sources, but mainly in the Canadian family physician in 2017, it was published about family medicine around the world, an overview by region. Now, we won't look at everything, but in sub-Saharan Africa, we know family medicine training started in the late 60s, in Central Africa, more in the 80s. But in sub-Saharan Africa, 74% of countries do not have family medicine training. Now, I know we can look at a glass of water that is half full and some people say it's half empty and others will say it's half full. Uh, in the same way, when we look at family medicine, we can uh, look at it in the same way. But here I want to emphasize 74% of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have family medicine training. That is why there's a need to promote family medicine training worldwide. Yes, there's also a lack of trained family physician teachers. And we know that the people to physician ratio is in some of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, 50,000 to one physician, as you see here, just very briefly presented. So based on that, we can say we need many more doctors and we need many more family physicians. Looking at South Africa, while there were beautiful initiatives in the last few decades and uh, family medicine educational outreaches to other countries in the African continent, quite a few of the countries, which was commendable and I think uh, made a beautiful contribution. In 2018, there were only 1,000 registered family physicians in South Africa. And in 2019, it is said only 
0.16 family physicians per 10,000 of the population. Now that basically means one trained family physician per 63,000 people in the country. So while it's a beautiful work that has been done and great physicians trained there, we can see there's a great need for this to be upscaled. The latest statistics I could get is from all eight medical schools, a total of approximately uh, 27 new family physicians qualify every year, which means an average of only three family physicians per medical school. You can uh, uh, agree with me, we want to see more to be done. In North America, we can go into that. Latin America, we all know about the amazing work that was done with community-oriented primary care development in Brazil. At one stage, 40,000 family health teams were there, but less than 15% were led by trained family physicians. And then if we look at Middle East, North Africa, uh, beautifully, 31 family medicine programs but graduating approximately six family physicians per program. And in Russia and Central Asia, still a struggle for better acceptance, though there are programs developing there as well. And in Asia, I'll just jump to China. Only 5% of more than 2 million doctors are family physicians or family physician assistants. Now, all of this is just helping us to see the void. As far as India is concerned, only 0.08% of medical colleges have a family medicine department. And in 2020, when the Medical Council of India brought out a new 890 page curriculum for the basic undergraduate training, there was no mention to general practice family medicine, family physicians. On the other side, something positively, over the last 15 years, more than 4,000 doctors were trained in family medicine through the Christian Medical College in Velour, uh, which is, I think, wonderful. But if you look at the bigger picture for India, you see the pink little portion there. That is the number of family medicine trained doctors in India. So you see, there is a great void and a great need for that to be worldwide. The lighter blue represents lower numbers of medical doctors, lower numbers of general medical practitioners, lower numbers of specialists, which includes family physicians as specialists. So it's clear the numbers are much too low. And then if you look globally, more than 40% of countries worldwide do not have family medicine training. There is a need to promote family medicine training worldwide. There is a tremendous need to promote the training of family physicians worldwide. Even more so if we say the need for Christ-centered family physician training. Then fourthly, there's a global core. Very briefly, you know that the World Health Organization in 2008 said primary health care now more than ever. And they said we need to train and retain adequate numbers of family physicians. But has that really happened? Also, there's, we believe, God's call for more doctors to practice family medicine and God's call for more doctors to practice Christ-centered family medicine. And then fifthly, very briefly, the ecology of medical care. You know, research in 1961 and 2001 showed this uh, box represents people in a community over a one month period. 0.8% find themselves over a one month period in hospital, 2% at hospital outpatient, 20% visit primary care clinicians, 80% have some symptoms. But we know that most of the emphasis many times and training mainly take place in that small place. But the bigger part is not cared for well. And that's the place of the family physician, both in those with symptoms, those who come for clinical care, and those who are uh, still without symptoms or signs. So 
If we just look at ecology of medical care, there's a great need for more family physicians. And then finally, as far as the why is concerned, we believe the Lord is leading in this direction. Family medicine has developed beautifully over the last decades. Family physician training has increased. And Christian family physician educators have been active in many countries, as you see listed here. And then the Christian Medical College, Villar, and ICMDA, and Loma Linda University were led by the law to expand the training of family physicians internationally. So there is the summary of why um, we say we need to promote family physician training worldwide. It shows the heart of God. It focuses on the whole person and whole family. There is a global void. There is a global call and God's call. There is the ecology of medical care helping us to see it. And it is the Lord leading us in this direction. I want to just repeat. We believe the Lord is leading us to promote family medicine training worldwide. The question is, how do we do that? And Dr. Jacob will take us uh, further along there. Over to you, Dr. Jacob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fricky. And delighted to be with all of you, even as we talk about promoting family medicine worldwide. Give me a second to screen share and talk about the how, as Dr. Fricky put it. So how do we create these family physicians? And how can we really promote uh, family medicine worldwide for all the reasons that Dr. Fricky put together so beautifully and more? There are so many more reasons, I'm sure. I just want to touch on a few here, um, <clears throat> which is very much related to our Indian experience here. So if I can just walk us through these um, points uh, quickly in the, in the next probably eight minutes, I think we would have done a good job. Okay, so the first one is example, courses, publications, organizations, IT. These are some of the things that we have experienced um, over this last um, you know, a decade or so. So let's just unpack this a little bit. The first thing is, um, like I said, this based on our Indian experience. The first is the example. Um, role modeling is a very biblical concept, isn't it? And there needs to be more and more family physicians who actually role model good family medicine practice. And that's something that we started with we said whoever is here, that small handful of family, family medicine, family physicians in India, my family medicine specialists, can we role model good family medicine care? So that started off. And like Dr. Fricky said, family medicine in India started somewhere in the 1980s, but there were very few takers. A lot of people who actually took family medicine were those who were committed to missions and wanted to work in mission hospitals. And so a lot of us did family medicine because we just needed to have that broader view of whole person care. And so a lot of us who went into mission started practicing family medicine. So the first thing is about example. The second thing is about courses or training. Um, and I know that Rebecca will talk more about it later, but I just want us to walk us through this journey of training that we have um, done in family medicine and how that has been a, a, a big game changer in India. So the first, uh, like I said, in 1988, the, dip, the diplomate in family medicine. So this was is called, the degree is called a DNB in family medicine. So it's not a university. It's actually a national board of examination instituted by the government and it can offer degrees. And actually, it's tough to pass that exam. And family medicine was part of that. There was no MD family medicine, which is only a very recent entry into the Indian scenario. So like and Dr. Like Dr. Fricky said, there's just five to six medical colleges who actually have departments of family medicine and have an MD in family medicine. So the DNB in family medicine was the one that was running from there. And a lot of us were trained in DNB in family medicine. Then uh, recently in 2021, a diploma in family medicine was started by the same board. 
Um, this is actually after a lot of groundwork that has been done in the meanwhile. Like you see, it's 1988 to 2021. There's so many efforts towards policy change. And that actually happened with, like what Dr. Fricky said, um, by the training that we put together for the PG Diploma in Family Medicine. It is a two-year blended learning program. And I just want to give you a very brief snapshot of this so that there's an understanding of um, uh, probably the learnings from this can actually go into promoting family medicine worldwide. So um, the PG Diploma in Family Medicine is a two-year blended learning program. And it started in 2006. And it's about taking education to the doorsteps of people who need it rather than telling them, oh, come to CMC well, or we'll train you in family medicine. And Dr. Fricky so nicely portrayed in his, uh, in his talk how, you know, like when we are just making six family physicians, seven family physicians, it is not enough. And especially for us in the Indian context, they're talking about um, 1.4 billion population. And how can we just produce a handful of family physicians every year? And what we have done is also so less, but still that those 4,000 family physicians trained, that critical mass of family physicians started engaging in various things. And then, you know, the, the family medicine, um, the more people talking and practicing good family medicine, and that led to a, even the diploma in family medicine starting in 2021. And also uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the organizations which have actually played a big role into it. So this course, as I said, is a blended learning program, and I'm sure all of us understand blended learning, especially with COVID times. Uh, we have transitioned a lot into blended learning, isn't it? And online learning, but this blended learning is actually, we combine online learning or learning with self-learning modules combined with a face-to-face hands-on skills development programs. So we have the online learning, which sometimes happens synchronously uh, at the same time. And there are also other things that are delivered asynchronously where the student can do self-study. Self and that the various components, like we have the modules, we have tailored skills training, we have these contact programs, like I was talking about video conferencing, pre-recorded video lectures, so that we use a variety of, uh, of materials for this, right? And um, we do a decentralized approach. Um, so in India as such, we have uh, so many centers like uh, for family medicine alone, this is, this is a training centers for all the blended learning courses we run, but we have about 13 centers across India for um, training in family medicine. And about the international family medicine course that Rebecca will talk about, we have centers across the globe as well. And so the training, the hands-on happens in their decentralized, in their local context, so that it makes a difference. All right, so um, this has led to a lot of working with the government, which is very exciting because the really poor actually access the public health system. The public health system needs strengthening. If only there were well-trained, good family physicians working in the public health system, the poor and the marginalized can really be impacted. And so we started offering this to the government doctors from 2008 onwards, starting with Tamil Nadu government doctors. And then we started engaging with various states across the country. And this has been again an exciting uh, experience because right now we are for the government of Chhattisgarh, which is a state government within India, we're training like in one batch 150 doctors with dedicated three mentor facilitators who are walking the journey with them. It's, it's hugely transformational. So that has been amazing. And that has actually led to informing a lot of, um, you know, the national policies on family medicine. Still a long way to go, uh, but it is, it's been something. It's been a good start. It's been an amazing journey. Like I said, this is the state of Chhattisgarh. 150 doctors in this batch and you know that's going on some snapshots of what happens in the hands-on programs so this is an on-site contact program this is one of our mentor facilitators with all these government doctors taking time off to be there and you know having discussions on x-rays practicing consultation skills 
practicing three-stage assessments during ward rounds, um, doing multiple role plays, you know, like here they are dealing like uh, doing a role play on angry patient, um, you know, role plays on seizures, there are many things that they actually do together. They learn how to do gentle physical examination and um, how they can do life-saving skills like neonatal resuscitation, CPR skills, how to take care of antenatal mothers with kindness and compassion, um, and how to really know the, the background of the patient by going for home visits. That has been hugely transformational for these doctors who work in the public health system. So if I have to summarize, the impact has been in these three areas. It has led to professional excellence, which then has, um, has uh, made family medicine uh, a, a specialty that people are now recognizing as something that, like Dr. Fricky said, um, a specialty which actually shows God's love to people. And it has uh, hugely impacted the ethics. I don't have time to go into it, but there's a lot of things that are not right with the way medicine is practiced in India, the way kickbacks are given from labs and uh, from the imaging centers. But the ethics and values that have, we have put into the course. Every day in the contact programs, uh, we start with a thought for the day, and then we talk about biblical values, and that has been hugely transformational for the doctors who come there, and the huge care component. Couple of um, feedback from our, from our Indian um, trained government doctors, right? So he's, this is a, here's a doctor, who talks about, I, he says, I would in due course handle all conditions, manage efficiently as being family physician without referring the patient, thinking about cost, time, and hurdles faced by them. So just the understanding of what the patient goes through and be able to think, how can I help the patient is a huge, um, you know, huge paradigm shift for a government doctor. And here is another doctor says that she's going to buy an ECG machine now because now she's confident in taking this. These are doctors who would, um, find it hard to even kind of, uh, they don't even go on time to their to their health centers, but now there's a lot of transformation. And here's another doctor, Dr. Praveen, talks about he really wants to keep in mind the great need in rural India. I'm in, now in a PHC. I'll try to be a competent family physician. I've decided to invest my time and knowledge with my four staff nurses, two A&M, six VANH. So he's basically thinking of training and investing on his team. I'll just run through the next few in the next couple of minutes. So next is the publications, which is very important in promoting family medicine. So there's the Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care, which is actually a journal that is published by uh, the Academy of Family Physicians in India. So that's um, some of our publications there, published in Medical Education, Global Health, and um, other, um, other places. So that's, again, we, something that we found that works in promoting, but you know, with the amount and quantum of training that you do, um, time available for making these publications is also limited. Organizations, again, the Academy of Family Physicians of India, as I said, has played a huge role in from 2011 onwards in promoting family medicine. We've had multiple national consultations in family medicine, and a lot of our trained graduates from this diploma blended learning programs have take, have they've contributed to various state chapters and they've built AFPI and they've contributed so much to the growth of family medicine. And um, Onka, of course, you know, it's global family doctor and Onka again is doing a lot of things worldwide. Again, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the IT platform is again great in promoting family medicine worldwide. So that's really given us like just, just now we are all in a Zoom platform, just being able to share these things about family medicine. And we are just connected from across the globe. So that's that's the space that the IT platform has given us to do. And to harness that for promoting family medicine is something that we have learned in this journey. You know, these are some of our modules, um, online modules. We've made apps for some of the, some primary care workers. And, you know, we can do skills development, um, you know, even do um, resuscitation and things online. This is skills training, consultation skills, practice online. So many things like that is possible. 
So friends, thank you for joining me in this journey where I just kind of walked you through our Indian experience where we looked at various avenues in which we can promote family medicine. And this learning has actually led us to take family medicine to another level, and that is actually the IPGDFM experience. And I would hand over to Dr. Rebecca to walk us through that. Thank you. Thank you, Jekin, and thank you, Dr. Fricky, for uh, um, your presentations about family medicine, the need globally, and uh, Thank you for doing the why and the how. And uh, I'm going to be uh, taking the next couple of minutes to continue on to this presentation. I was looking at uh, some of the Q and A's and I hope that part of what we um, look at in this next 10 minutes or so will answer some of those questions because I'm going to be talking about uh, a continuation of the how through our international postgraduate diploma in family medicine. Um, so this is basically what we call as the IPGDFM, uh, which is short for the International Postgraduate Diploma in Family Medicine. And I'm going to spend a few minutes just telling you about this course and uh, the story behind how this even came. Um, so far, you've heard about the need, uh, the, the need not just uh, in a country like India, but across the globe. And uh, Jaykin took us through uh, the how, uh, through some of our experiences in distance education here at Velour in India. Um, and from that has emerged this course, which we are so excited to present. Some of you in this webinar might already be very well aware of this, and some of you might be hearing it for the first time, uh, but I'd just like to give you a short summary on this. So, um, as you heard from Jaykin about the family medicine training that we have been running since 2008, um, along the years, uh, some of the conversations with like-minded organizations from across the globe was about how can we have similar training for other countries that have similar health needs like India does, you know, Southeast Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world. And so this has been something that has always been at the back of our mind and we've been thinking and praying about it. And it was in uh, 2018 that the conversations got uh, more serious. And uh, when we uh, met with uh, ICMDA and uh, talked about a previous course that we had been a part of for just a few years, um, which then did not continue, but we were looking at the needs saying, uh, you know, there is training like this that is needed in other parts of the world. So ICMD and CMC Valor um, also then approached Loma Linda University in the US. Uh, they have been a long time partner with CMC in other avenues. And so the three organizations kind of had the same vision and said that, you know, let's do this together. It took nearly two years of conversations back and forth between the three partners that you see here on the screen. Uh, but we're so happy that all three of the partners really felt uh, one as far as this vision was concerned. And so that is how this course, the International Postgraduate Diploma in Family Medicine came into existence. And we were able to launch this in May of 2020, bang in the middle of the pandemic, which in itself was nothing short of a miracle. We were not sure about uh, you know, whether we would have people enroll, uh, the whole world was in turmoil. But one thing we knew is that um, this is online. There might be people who are looking and who have the time to be able to do something online. So let's just begin and see what happens. And that's how it started. Um, the aim of the course, um, as you can see here on the screen, is to train and certify doctors with postgraduate training in family medicine in the developing world and to equip them professionally and spiritually to say, serve their country with a focus on the poor. Um, so as we went back and forth, we also had to define the roles. You know, what role would each of the partners play? And um, ICMDA with all of their chapters across the world, uh, you know, said that, you know, we are happy to help identify contact centers, talk to our partners, establish these places of training, and also help to take care of a lot of the administrative processes um, Josh and Dr. Peter, Dr. Santosh, Baskar, others in the team, they look after the registration process, the collection of the fees, um, finding the funds in order to be able to support and give scholarships to those doctors who are unable to pay uh, the course fee 
just all of those processes are taken care by ICMBA. We here in CMC, because of our experience of all the other courses, were able to actually develop the entire curriculum. We did have the basic modules in the form of printed material already for our Indian course. And it was more than a year's worth of work between our academic faculty and our IT faculty and admin people to take that all and create online modules from it to then find the best platform onto which we put the modules and to also run faculty development workshops so that we can standardize the training across the globe. So that was our role and that continues to be our role even as we've launched this course. And Loma Linda University stepped in being a large university uh, with you know, many, many programs that they run. Um, they were willing to provide an accreditation and almost like a quality check where they said that, you know, we will kind of um, give our stamp of approval on the certificate and also be available maybe to travel every once in a while when the, when the contact sessions, uh, the face-to-face -face sessions are going on and be able to give uh, our input into that. And so that is the main roles uh, that the three partners play. And it's been, uh, I must say, an absolute joy um, to work with ICMD and with Loma Linda in this program. Now, this is a two-year blended learning curriculum. It is designed to hone distinct skills, knowledge, and attitudes in a family physician. We often talk about the fact that knowledge and skills can so easily be acquired from anywhere. You know, you just need to ask Dr. Google and they'll give you, um, you know, lots and lots of information on what we need. How do we take that, make it relevant? How do we also find skills that are practical? And most importantly, how do we impart values and attitudes so that what they really see is a Christ-like position? And so that is what, in all the courses we run, that is kind of our, our aim. And so the motto, you know, which came out of the Indian course was refer less, resolve more, because a lot of the general practitioners here in India, we notice, uh, do not feel uh, confident enough to be able to resolve more on their own. They see a patient and they refer them to the various specialists. And so we are uh, helping them to feel more confident of their practice, because a lot of what we see can be taken care by the general practitioner with this two-year um, training. So that is the, uh, the main focus in this curriculum, whether it's in the knowledge component, the skills, or the attitudes. The other thing that we realized, uh, you know, as some of you heard a lot about the Indian scenarios and the, the, it's been running in India for so many years, but how do we uh, contextualize it for the world? We need uh, people from all across the world. We need people who've worked as missionaries in different countries, people who are trained in family medicine and medicine in other areas to be able to help us with the global contextualization. And we're happy that partners have come along, but we are in need of more people to actually join hands there. And this is so important for the training to be relevant. Uh, there is no point in us just talking about, this is what happens in India, or this is the way we do in India. And it's been amazing, even the scenarios in our modules have now come out of Cambodia and African countries. We've got scenarios from the students themselves that we are able to use uh, in the modules. So we really need to make it relevant for the health system in those regions. This map is just to show you the contact centers, like I mentioned, apart from this self-learning component, which is online, the contact centers are uh, a time and a place where we're able to bring the student doctors to mission hospitals across the world. They spend about a week and it's a time to really get to know them. There's a lot of peer learning, there's hands-on uh, you know, training that happens. Uh, and it's also a time to really talk about uh, values and ethics and why we practice medicine the way we do. Uh, that is why that is you know the the main thing. So uh, what you see up here, the uh, red triangles are the ones that are the existing contact centers already. We have six of them: Egypt, Nigeria, Uganda, Cambodia, India, and Pakistan. And we're looking at the next phases are the blue triangles with the red border. Uh, Niger, Chad, Angola, Indonesia, Honduras. We're in conversation with um, uh, some of the mission hospitals in these centers. And uh, not only to open more centers, but we're also working on translating the entire course material into Spanish, French, and Russian so that the reach would be much more uh, for those who are uh, more comfortable in those languages. Um, because we started our first cohort in May of 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, Till 2022, we were unable to have any of our face-to-face -face 
sessions, the contact programs. It was completely online, which was a new experience for us. You know, what we teach on site, we had to learn how to do online. And we were able to cover a lot of ground, but nothing can replace the face-to-face -face interactions. And so finally in 2002, September of 2002, we were able to conduct our first contact programs. And what I'm gonna show you are just a couple of pictures that you can see. This is a group um, that was uh, uh, here in India looking at some POP. Uh, this was the cohort in Cambodia. Uh, along with Dr. Anbarsi in the background. This was our uh, uh, group in Nigeria uh, with a couple of our facilitators. This was our cohort in uh, Uganda along with Dr. Peter and uh, Sally from the UK. This was the group that came to Velour uh, and this was the group in Egypt. We had to merge Pakistan and Egypt this year together because the numbers were very um, small. And it was just amazing to debrief and hear the experiences both from the student doctors as well as the facilitators who were there. So currently we have two batches, the batch of 2021 and the batches of 2022. And you can see the numbers here. It's been amazing to see the numbers grow. Uh, in 2021, we have 36 to, uh, student doctors from 20 different countries. In 2022, we have 48 in that batch representing 28 different countries. And we're just so thankful to the Lord for this. Growth. We're also very excited to say that our first batch, which started in 2020, have actually completed and graduated. 25 graduates who have received their diplomas from 13 countries. We had an online graduation ceremony for them, which was very special. Um, and uh, they have now completed. And uh, uh, just kind of uh, want to finish there by saying that uh, there are many ways in which any of you can be involved. Uh, firstly, you know, we'd ask you to pray for this course, pray for the partners. If you are interested in facilitating in this program, whether it's online or in the contact programs that we run on site, please do contact us. We would uh, love to have more people on board. Also promote the training in your own region. ICMD has all of the information on their website, um, as do we. Uh, and, uh, you know, it can be shared with others. And we're happy to take any uh, questions or, or clarifications you might have. I also just want to end, and I'm sure this is again something that all of you know about, but ICMDA's World Congress that's coming up from the 20th to the 25th of June in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, as part of the pre-conference, we will be running a two-day workshop, which is more of a, a faculty development where we're going to be training uh, people who are interested to come on board and be facilitators with us in this program. So if any of you are interested or all of you are interested, please do go to the website arusha2023.icmd.net and please look at this uh, faculty development workshop. It's under the stream of pre-conference. And if you're interested, we would love for you to register and be there for that. So I'll stop with that and I'll hand back to Dr. Santosh and then we're happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Friki, Jackin and uh, Rebecca for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, maybe I could request Jackin and Friki to come on uh, the panel. Uh, we will have a short time of question and answer now. Let us uh, look at some, uh, there's some, some questions here. One of the questions which was there is to Rebecca, uh, is this an accredited degree or is it, uh, uh, is it a valid medical degree? Um, I'll start with the Indian story and then uh, go to the global story. So in India, the uh, National Medical Council, which is kind of the accrediting board, does not um, accredit any distance medical course. Uh, all of the distance medical courses, you know, an, a university or a college has the rights to run them, uh, but they, they are not accredited like the um, residential courses are. Therefore, the answer is no, it is not accredited to a body. But having said that, CMC is able to give its own diplomas and we have lots and lots of doctors who are still enrolling every year. So what we tell them is that this is not equivalent to a residential degree, but it is a skills training or an upgradation of your skills in order for you to be a more confident practitioner. Now, when it comes to the global scenario, it's a lot more complicated than that because there are so many different medical councils within Africa. There are, you know, different ones. Asia has different ones. So uh, we are, at the moment, it's not accredited with any council, but we are in conversations with various bodies. And if there is a university, for example, a Christian university in Africa that would like to take it up 
and help with the acc accreditation process, we're more than happy to be in conversation. Thank you. Um, there's a question regarding uh, from uh, Latin America. Um, I know we don't have programs in Latin America, so how can we help uh, Latin American centers? And one and related question is also as centers are outside the region, has visa difficulties have been considered? How can these be handled? Rebecca, you want to? Well, uh, if I could maybe just uh, Go ahead. add something to the first question about the accreditation. Yeah. Because we know that is a great need for many doctors in the developing country as far as their career development is concerned. But the reality is you cannot be accredited with a specialist degree if you haven't done an appropriate residential course. Uh, unfortunately. On the other hand, we have had, uh, we have seen that some people that have not done a degree course are more of a family physician than someone who have done a degree course, but the principles is not heart and soul part of their practice. So yes, we would like to develop the accreditation possibilities, but at the same time, the most important thing is to be a true family physician. And we believe that even a blended learning course like this really help us to be what we hope to be as uh, family physicians. As far as Latin America is concerned, I saw the comment, I've copied the links that the participant shared with us and I'll be very, very happy to look at it. Obviously our presentation was very, very brief based on the data we have. And uh, we, there are many things we don't know. We are very eager to learn more about Latin America, what is done there, what we can learn from one another in terms of how to work together in future. Once again, opportunities like this can create the links. Also, uh, just as a thought, the resources that were developed here over uh, 15 years, were all published in workbooks for learners, 15 books of <clears throat> around about uh, 100 to 150 different modules. And all of that is now online. And hopefully uh, very soon, we will have that as an app that you can either uh, download or buy with a tab, etc., which potentially means that our alumni or students or maybe others in future, I, I can't say on that, would have access to that. So if any uh, course or any program feel that they could benefit by having access to resources that have been developed, the least would be to share. Uh, so in that way, we could maybe cross-pollinate as well. Just a thought, thank you. Thank you, uh, Friki. Maybe Rebecca could respond to these two questions. If you want, if any region is not covered, if people want to join uh, or start a new language, what would be the uh, processes? The second link question is for face-to-face -face contact, uh, travel and other visa issues, has it been considered? That's the question. Thank you, Dr. Santos. So uh, yes, right now, as you saw, uh, you know, three of our centers are in Africa, and then we have one in India, Cambodia, and Pakistan. So definitely, uh, there are large regions that are not covered, and it is our hope that we will be able to have more centers and offer the course in more languages. And we are in conversation with ICMD and with uh, Loma Linda University about that. For now, in our, you know, our first experience was last September, and I'll talk about the visas. Most of the doctors, you know, we we a lot we give them a choice of what center they want to pick to come for the contact program, uh, and they take the responsibility of applying for a visa to come for that week. We are happy to provide letters of invitation for them to come and join us in the contact program, saying that they are a student of the course. 
Um, but over time, we really hope that, especially in Latin America, we can have centers. We need to have at least another center or two maybe in, um, in Africa. We are in a conversation with a hospital in Honduras about that. And also, uh, we are working very hard. We formed translation groups uh, in Spanish, French, and Russian at the moment who have also started looking at the modules and some translation work has begun. And it's our prayer that in another uh, maybe two years, we'll be ready with that, which means then we have regional teams because sitting here in India, we can't speak those languages so we can support from the back end, but we need regional teams. We need bilingual students who understand you know, English plus the language of their country. Uh, and so if in any way you're able to be involved in that, either to help look at a center in a region where it's not there, or be part of the translation work and part of a team that can run it in another uh, course, please do contact either IC India or us and we'll be more than happy to um, have further conversation with you. Uh, there are a couple of questions on scholarships for the IPGDFM. Rebecca, you want to respond to that? Sure, Dr. Santosh, anything particular about the scholarship? The question how of- can get, How can I get scholarship? Then? Okay. All right. So yes, we do have a process. We do understand that for many doctors, the fee structure is, is on the higher side. And so as part of the application, there is a question about whether or not they want uh, to apply for a scholarship. And if so, then there is an additional scholarship form plus a letter from the place that they're working, kind of supporting their need for scholarship. And then uh, we have a scholarship committee that meets and looks at the documents. And then there are various categories of scholarships and we're able to offer the maximum possible based on those reviews. But uh, we have been able to give quite a few scholarships to many, many doctors in the courses so far. Yeah. The other question is, uh, uh, somebody who has got a bachelor degree in public health, can he apply for family medicine? So the criteria for us is that you need to have a degree as a physician, an MBBS degree or its equivalent. Uh, so with a valid registration to be able to practice medicine in any country, it doesn't matter where, uh, but these are the two. So if there is a uh, MBBS doctor who's then also gone on and got a public health degree by all means, uh, but if there is no basic medical graduate degree available, then uh, you know, it would be difficult to do this course. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a comment from Dr. Bruce Dalman's friend. You know Rebecca very well. Uh, do you want to respond to that? It's, I can uh, read it out to you. Uh, 20 African church hospitals have a university-based degree of medicine, family medicine, or regionally accredited by Western African College of Physicians in a three or four year full residencies. The question is how can we what opportunities might be considered for collaboration with these programs and the diploma program? Thank you for reading the question out. I did see it and I saw Bruce's name there. Thank you for the question. I will, uh, I will answer it and then I'll also ask uh, uh, my colleagues if they'd like to uh, add to it as well. Um, the CAP program is something that we are aware of. We've been in conversation earlier. And I think having a residential program, like we always talk about in our team, is the gold standard. You know, to be actually able to go and stay and live and study for three, you know, three years or more uh, is the gold standard. However, we are looking at a need uh, for larger numbers and in areas where that's not possible. Um, so the thought that comes to my mind is, you know, certainly, you know, we we should not be reinventing our own own wheels and look to see how we can work together and if there are opportunities where there are doctors who uh, do the blended learning program and then want a higher level of skill through a residential program or even want to find a hospital where they can go and few, spend a few months in order to have more hands-on training, I think we should really find ways to collaborate along with CAP and be able to do that. Uh, so yes, you know, really happy to and hopefully we'll, uh, we can do some conversations on Zoom or bump into each other in conferences and talk more about that. Jakin, I see your hand raised, so I'll, I'll hand over to you to continue with. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, um, 
couple of things that I wanted to say in this regard. Like Dr. Friki started with the huge need for family medicine. Um, so I feel that there is an there is space for a lot of us doing different things in family medicine in different areas. And the Lord uses that to bless people across. So <clears throat> as much as I agree that on one side, we don't have to reinvent wheel. On the other hand, it's also okay to do different things. The same thing I say in India as well. We have so much need in the 1.4 billion population. Any number of people doing any different versions of family medicine, it's still good. And especially with um, Christian family, Christian focused family medicine training, it's beautiful in whichever form it is. So that is one thought that I felt that even though we should always explore areas for collaboration, on the other hand, there is, there is space for so much inputs for family medicine, and we should try and input into all the spaces. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is to often uh, we talk about lateral entry in Indian context. So suppose there is a three-year program or a four-year program, um, you know, like, like Rebecca said, not everybody is available or is able to come and do a residential program. So it's very difficult. So what helps also is to have something like a hybrid where some, some part of the program is actually done online with whatever it is. And once they've, uh, you know, kind of um, met certain criteria or gathered certain credits, then they get a lateral entry into the the full residential program, which means then they don't have to do the full four years or three years, but they get lesser number of years that they can do. So it gives them a space not to be away from wherever they are for like three or four years, but also gives the flexibility to actually have an on-site residential training. It's just best of both worlds. So those are ways we can think of, you know, how these things can play out. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Bruce about lateral entry of diploma graduates. Jacqueline, you want to kind of respond quickly before I wind up? It actually works the other way around because we are running a blended learning program. So actually we have tried to uh, get lateral entry for our students into the diplomate in family medicine, which is a three-year residency, residency. And their head had actually come and interacted with us and things like that. But uh, in Indian system, like he changed and then that didn't go forward. So we've not really... Uh, uh, I don't think it works the other way around because ours is uh, not a residential program. It's a blended learning program. So we could plug into any other residential program, which is willing to let them do part of its blended learning, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are many comments in the chat box uh, from our existing mm -hmm. students, encouraging all of you. Uh, thank you, friends, who have commented there. Um, I think our time is... Uh, coming to the end. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Friki, uh, Rebecca, and Jackin for that excellent presentation. As this uh, shared, there are various opportunities to partner. You can join the course, you can promote the course, you can help in translations. You can uh, identify centers in different languages where you can uh, encourage people to become alumni and later become our uh, regional hub to start uh, other languages. Uh, our hope is that by 2025, three languages, we can roll it out. So thank you very much for joining us. God bless you and see you again.